So I'll, um, I think we've probably have a quorum for today. We have uh, he joining also from, from Verizon. So we'll get um, get kicked off here, and then um, in a few minutes, Lee, after you're ready, just let me know, and I'll um, I'll pass it over to you. The um, the first part of the call, I want to kind of talk a little bit about the work group's future um, aspects, right? And so there's a couple of things we've identified um, that we want to work on in this work group. At the same time that we've been, you know, having meetings and discussions, the CNCF um, TOC has also been having meetings and discussions on creating SIGs. And one of the SIGs that they've identified is a SIG called the Traffic SIG. And it's not the, the first one that they're working on, but I've asked them to look at it second. But I think that our, our network work group should probably fold into that Traffic SIG and become, you know, we become part of the Traffic SIG versus having a work group outside of the CNCF TOC SIGs. And so um, I know there's only a you know a handful of us on this call, but I'm assuming you guys, I see Lee shaking his head. So I'm assuming most everyone's in agreement that that's the right next step for the work group. Yeah, for, yeah. Ken, for my part. And, and actually did they, was that SIG previously named network and maybe just refactored to be traffic so it incorporated more? Or? Yes. It did start out as as network, and then it, it changed the traffic without me realizing it until maybe a month ago. And I, I sent an email to the TOC privately asking them if it's um you know, if it's going to be named traffic or network or network security because they or, or, or and I kind of asked them like what they're going to do with the security piece because they didn't really have a security um, they had safe discussions right, but safe wasn't really a SIG, and so I, I kind of raised that question. I never got a response actually. Um, the last TLC call I couldn't join. I had had a, 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 a like a major incident mask we were working on that I had to jump into and help work on. And so, so I don't know if they even discussed it um, at that TLC or not. Um, they sent out a vote. I think the vote for the for the SIGs was just to have SIGs, not on the specific SIGs they were going to have yet. Right. And so I think they're kind of approving, first of all, that we're going to have SIGs within the CNCF. And then the second votes would then, I guess, be discussions on what work group we want to form and or what SIGs we want to form around the new, um, the new model. So long way to answer your question, Lee, is I believe, yes, it changed from network to traffic. And I'm not sure where the security aspects are going to land yet. Okay. Um, at the risk of opening up a rabbit hole that has no bottom, <laughs> uh, there there has always been this kind of um, uncertainty. Well, it's not really an uncertainty. There's the, my point is there's a Kubernetes SIG network, and Kubernetes is not the whole of CNCF, right. um, but it's there's not much that's in the gap. And uh, I think that definitely confuses people yeah. or, you know, or possibly we're doing it wrong. I mean, you know, the, the, when I go to KubeCon, AKA cloud native con and talk about CNI, people ask me questions that begin, what is, what does the CNCF think about blah? And my answer is I never really heard from the CNCF on the subject of anything to do with networking. <laughs> Yeah, Brian, I, I really, I'll add in some commentary. I think that uh, potentially with the reboot of this working group into, or as the SIGs come forth and this actually reboots into the traffic SIG, that um, there's actually, there's a litany of um, unaddressed topics and conversations, uh, projects that are out there that, um, you know, that, that need analysis or need a venue to have, you know, to be presented and have discussion over. The, yeah, it had been, I think, you know, at least for my part, the networking working group had been one of the first to, to like, you know, curate and <clears throat> curate and suggest a project. I recognize C and I was like, <clears throat> I think 10th one in, but, um, but I don't know how many other cities or how many other working groups have really gotten that far and kind of done, done that process. It was kind of after C and I, after we'd done that initial duty, um, just, just, I think between people's personal schedules and a bit of uh, 
you know, in the wake of uncertainty about what how far a charter can go and how much responsibilities are empowered to, you know, how much it's encouraged and, and, um, and how much the working groups themselves are empowered to define part of that, you know, to, to go off and do things. Um, having spent a lot of time inside the serverless working group that can also the stewards, um, that one certainly kind of took it upon itself to expand its scope of responsibility well beyond, it even has something of a sub or, or sort of generated a sub working group on cloud cloud events, which in essence, that working group spawned a new CNCF project, a new spec, you know, cloud events. And so um, the, at least all of the verbiage inside of the SIG doc that's being voted on outlines a lot of that a bit better about the mechanics of how they should work. Um, the delineation responsibility between the TOC and the SIGs and and I totally agree with you, and, and it's in part why I know Ken was guiding us over the last couple of meetings toward um, a definition of the roadmap for the working group and kind of what topics are there, what do we need to address, and how do we how do we you know either generate a white paper and, and get some get some more activity and discussion with just really more participation. I'm hopeful that, or for my part, I've got kind of fingers crossed that one. Ken is able to take on a similar role in the, um, the forthcoming state. Uh, and then two, that just, I think the collection of new entrance, entrants and new interests, I think, I think we'll see it maybe change. Um, I think there will still be a bit of a contention and, and um, like it's like a lot of the stuff that we talk about is in context of Kubernetes. And so um, even for C and I, when, when it, like the delineation between response, who has responsibility and governance over individual projects. And I think that's, you know, hopefully clear, broadly clear to everyone that it's those projects that are self-governing. And so it's not these working groups that lord over them and tell, you know, tell a project like CNI that we need to update this or change that to be, you know, network compatible or whatever that are, you know, that um, I think that was kind of a point of confusion. I don't know if you felt it being a CNI maintainer uh, before in, in this call, but like, Anyway, I, th I think I think it's a little bit of a different. It's almost been how long we've been doing this? Like a year, this uh, networking work group. So, yeah, it's been about a year and a half now. So it's been it's been going on for some time. Well, to, to your specific point, uh, yes, I knew that projects were self-governing. Yeah, uh, no, sorry, not you. I meant uh, not into you, but I just meant in like to, to the layman or to the un. In, yeah. To the it's. Uh, it is, yeah, pe people kind of fill the vacuum with their own idea of how it might work. Um, people on the outside. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, Ken, is it part of the um, process that you're taking us through to, to outline you know, topic areas? It sounds like we're headed into that being good input into the, you know, the, the traffic scene. Yeah, yeah. I think the the main one we've discussed were around. Um, we kind of talked about like service meshes, service um, um, service chaining as as a not related to service mesh, but you know has the same first name of course. But um, you know, to kind of do things with like you know firewall and low balancing. Um, and you know DNS. We also had some presentations on um, IPv6 support and how do we get um, you know IPv6 um, more of a, a standard supported pattern within the cloud native models. Most of the cloud native solutions out there are not IPv6 um, compliant or you know capable even for that matter, other than just a IPv4 to IPv6 translation layer, right? Um, we also talked about things like QoS and and how to the, you know how to kind of map some of the QoS type of of models into a cloud native framework, and then um, you know some of the the day two we talked a little bit about some of the day two aspects that are needed in networking. Um, this kind of what, what I think your presentation originally came up, Lee was, you know, kind of talking about some of the, the ability to visualize traffic and, and network and how to like things like cloud events coming out of the others, um, you know, the, 
the serverless model, right? How do we sort of declare what parameters or what metrics, I guess I would say, need to be monitored and managed in a in a cloud native network model, right? That helps with um, the deployment patterns for cloud native models. Right, right. I uh, <clears throat> just uh, us having brought this conversation up, I I wonder if we shouldn't. Um, as we had, so Ken, as, I know, as we were considering kind of a uh, 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 networking work group deep dive for KubeCon EU. Yeah. I wonder if that isn't, we've got a, a couple of months, I wonder if it isn't um, a time. Kind of document it, that, yeah. Or, or yeah, or in order to like potentially boot, you know, if the CNCF is ready, like boot, boot that, sort of kickstart the traffic scene. You know, to kind of have that part of the formation. Sounds good. And as a as a point of information, the CNI project has not applied for a spot on the agenda. Well, not yet. I mean, it's past the application date, but we can probably get one. Um, but I would think the the bigger thing, the traffic sig, is a better one because uh, I think it better matches what people think they're showing up to. Uh, actually, Brian, a point of curiosity with your CNI maintainer hat on. Um, uh, has have you been? Has there been much ado about the um, Istio CNI? Can be um, there? Uh, it came up. Um, yeah, I mean that's a good example. CNI is a project; doesn't care who uses it. You know, it's a spec; it's an interface. And uh, so the fact that the Istio project has found something useful to do with CNI is just, you know, great. Move along. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's that's exactly the kind of thing that that trips people up because they they kind of <laughs> want to say something, and that to with my CNI maintainer hat on, you know, the the most impactful. I can say is we're not going to put something into CNI that stops someone like Istio doing something, or you know we're not going to make a change for Istio that stops Kubernetes doing something. We're not going to make a change for Kubernetes that stops, um, you know, some other project from doing something. That's that's the main line that we draw, trying to be a neutral interface for everyone. Uh, and and you know you kind of get that far in the conversation, and people go, well, that's kind of boring. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I guess to your point, the, the you know, so the implementation work is being done in an Istio CNI repository in you know in Istio or in, in that project. So the work is done. The implementation work is done in the other projects. In itself, in fact, so we had, um, uh, spoken with one of those uh, the contributors to that project uh, in context of. This next presentation, Meshery, um, mostly just to gain an understanding of part of the Istio CNI goals. And, and uh, anyway, it was enlightening, so just point of interest. Mm -hmm. Uh, can that, um... I think that that's sort of why I wanted to like leave that. And I think we'll take some action to sort of, you know, I might send a note to the mailing list, kind of identifying some of these areas we talked about and get some feedback from everyone on, and then we'll take that into the SIG formation. Nice, nice. And with that, I'll turn it over um, to you, Lee, to kind of demo, you know, give the uh, presentation demo. Oh, you okay. Oh, very good. Yeah. Uh, well, as I go into this, let me um, let me call out uh, Garish, who's on the phone as well, um, who's gonna who's going to partake in this presentation. Garish and I just made these slides forty five minutes ago, so um, so they're, they're they're pretty well baked at this point. Um, but. Uh, uh, there's a couple of reasons why Garish is here with me um, presenting. One, because he's um, a driving force uh, behind this. Uh, also, two, he's part of the genesis story for 
why we got off of our lazy rumps and um, you know, laid down some code um, into a project that uh, we did, you know, has been dubbed Meshery. Um, the genesis story is that you know that, that he and I had gone around to this last year giving about five different um, Istio uh, workshops, introducing people to service mesh concepts and kind of you know, teaching them. Um, uh, you know, going through lab, a bunch of different labs on how to use Istio. And, and as part of that, it, you know, over that year, there became a pretty clear theme. And at least for me, there were two questions that were universally asked almost as the first two things out of people's mouths um, once the presentation was over. Um, and that had to do with, um, well, let me, that had to do with this. It was kind of, it was two things. It was uh, one from an adopter's perspective, in which most of the audience generally was, and people not using service mesh, people coming to ask these two questions. It's like, well, hey, this is you're basically, you know, this is great. I see the value. There's a lot of promise here. Um, so hey, which service mesh do you recommend I get started with? It looks like you know, you, you've spoken to a number of them. It's like, oh, okay. Now, you know, I'll withhold my response, but um, but the acknowledgement there is is that you know just like and there's many many examples of this, but just you know, near and dear to my heart has been the um, kind of the, the container orchestration wars and um, the uh, uh, facilitation of familiarization with the container orchestrators and what's what's different about them, which ones are better for different use cases or for your particular environment and. Um, and so as we enter into the, I don't know if it was 2008, I don't know if it was 2018 or, or if it's this year, or how you, the, the year of the service match, but as we enter into this sort of third phase of, you know, your, your people's cloud native journey, at least in my mind, and we enter into the, you know, service mesh is being adopted, but hopefully we can do we collectively maybe can do better about uh, facilitating people easily deploying these things and understanding them, um, gaining some familiarity in a sandbox environment. Um, you know, I consider that, and maybe I've got it wrong, but I consider the rancher in the days of container orchestrators probably did that pretty well, really facilitated easy deployment of sort of your choice of the, you know, the, the more popular orchestrators at the time. And so it's our hope that maybe Meshri can help facilitate that. But more pertinent to our discussion today and to this working group is um, the second question that would commonly come. And it's, you know, basically starts the same. It's like, well, great, I see the value of service mesh. It's very interesting to us. Um, and then the engineer in them says, but aha, what's the catch? Like this doesn't come for free. The, there's overhead here. What's you know, you're not telling me the, you know, you know what, what that looks like. And so um, measuring is intended and, and what it's being worked on foremost right now is to be a, a performance benchmark tool. And it's uh, to help illuminate and answer that question. What's the catch? What's the overhead? Hopefully in, um, in uh, well, I was going to say a layman's way, or hopefully in a with a decent user experience, or one that um, maybe errs on the side of being usable uh, and potentially not as complex as different projects might need for it to be. Um, we're going to talk about the various projects and contributions, and interactions that are going on within the the, the tool itself within the community, but. Um, uh, but suffice to say, at the moment, that, that some of the projects, um, I could see a future where they're potentially using Meshery as their performance benchmarking tool. Um, I'll highlight why that might be. Um, and so, yeah, so it's those two questions it's kind of that, that are kind of front and center for the tool. Um, I think that that's an adopter's question and their dilemma. I think that ongoing, um, an open source tool like Meshery can be valuable to the operator. Or the developer. I mean, just you know, basically the you know day two um, after you stood up a playground and mess with things, and and, and you did, you've chosen a, a service mesh, or maybe you've chosen two because you're such a large organization that you've got multiple heads and people are doing different things. That um, 
it, it can still provide a sandbox for understanding a playground or a sandbox for understanding new functionality as new versions of you know the the your chosen service mesh um, continues to grow and, and you can go play with those and experimentation of those and, and doing it in context of your application. Um, some service meshes facilitate this better than others, but to the extent that you're able to deploy them easily with a tool like this, it could help. Um, then also there's this question about performance and it's, um, it's an ongoing question. So it's, it was the initial, hey, what, what, what's the overhead? Um, but, it, it, and maybe you've deployed, you know, Istio 1.0, uh, for example, and then 1.1 comes out, and then very quickly 1.1.1 comes out to fix the bugs. Um, well, did that introduce any new overhead? Uh, and so the ability to uh, do these performance tests and uh, keep a history of them, do them against either sample apps to just facilitate kind of playing with the, the mesh, or do them against your own applications in your environment um, to persist those results and to let you share those results. Um, the tool will um, facilitate collecting those anonymously. And uh, as part of the project's goals to publish that back to the, you know, the public about um, hopefully in a way in which doesn't make any particular mesh look poorly, but just really helps facilitate adoption and answer people's questions, help, helps make all of the meshes look good to say that, hey, on average, you know, the, the, you know, the percent of CPU used is, is only this much for, a for any given service mesh. So, so what are you waiting for about using them? So that's the kind of the genesis of what we're hoping that people will get out of it. We've had um, uh, sort of got our initial start with um, the University of Austin, Texas. So I'm here in Austin. Um, my, my draw doesn't come out all the time, but try to try to drop a y'all occasionally. Uh, and I uh, had a, a professor within the computer um, electrical computer and electrical engineering um, school uh, donate the well or get two two of his uh, graduate students to uh, wrap their thesis around uh, this tool and, and analysis of performance. So getting some assistance there. There's a high performance computing environment that they're uh, willing to give us time on. Um, we had uh, just. Uh, We've clearly like gone to each of the more prominent service mesh projects and engaged with them to describe the functionality and, and request um, contribution. I've gotten a very positive feedback. We just uh, spent uh, a very giddy hour with uh, HashiCorp yesterday uh, on console. Um, so there's a couple of the way that mesh itself as a project is structured um, has adapters. So we'll, we'll look at the architecture here in a minute. But, but um, the, sort of in the works are adapters for these more prominent service meshes. We've um, just met with the app mesh team physically a couple of times, discussed this tool very early on, and we've yet to really go back to them and say, hey, it's in a place where you may want to consider you know, writing your adapter now. Anyway, just as a community, we meet once a week, record our, you know, take meeting minutes, record the meeting minutes, um, post them on YouTube. There's a couple of, I think the project's been fortunate to be uh, asked to be presented just yesterday, uh, asked to be presented at Service Mesh Day this week uh, at DockerCon coming up. Um, it's on the schedule for KubeCon EU and then uh, in the interim at Container World. So that's great. But the, the nice thing is, uh, too, the, just trying to bootstrap interest uh, that um, both for Linkerd and Envoy, it's been, or it's uh, part of the goals of this project are have been incorporated into the CNCF project list. So we'll, we'll see if we don't get people assisting there. So maybe enough for some of the boring stuff. Um, take a look at the architecture and, and do a bit of a demo. So architecture, relatively simple tool written in Go, um, is intended to be a utility that you know, it's a container, a Go binary that's containerized that you can either deploy on your local you know, development machine or, you know, or into your cluster if you want to. Um, you can deploy it onto the mesh, but, but probably recommend that you, you don't, so you're not, that's, that's one less variable in the environment as you go to do performance testing. Um, it's right now, it's using Ford.io as a load generator. Ford.io is the load generator of choice for Google's performance testing of Istio. 
IBM's performance testing of Istio uses a proprietary tool, um, Blue, uh, Reg Patrol, um, that they do some wonderful work with and, and uh, publish some of their results. Um, that's a very interesting working group that's going on in the uh, Istio community. And they've been, if you've paid attention to like the, the latest Istio 1.1 release, there's been some significant strides in terms of performance there. Some realizations around uh, the cost of telemetry, like the, the cost of uh, really much more of like the distributed, you're gathering the sampling of distributed traces, how frequently you're doing that. There's a, just like, that's, that kind of stands out as being um, a resource hub, depending upon how frequently you're sampling. Anyway. Anyway, point is back to the architecture of measuring um, as a tool deployed um, locally and um, connect up the adapters to your service mesh. Um, point it, either have it deploy a sample app for you or point it to your um, app's endpoint. Tell it to generate load. Um, it'll send back the results. Um, I won't steal this. Uh, Lee, uh, my apology. I just want to ask a simple question here. How do you define the service and give me a two, one or two examples of how do you match them and what do you end up with it? Uh, so, uh, Mamet, I heard your first question, which was how do you define a service and and yes. that what yes. And that answer there being your application. So if you're at the end point mm -hmm. of your application, assuming that's broadly assuming that's HTTP. Um, okay, so then application you call it a service here. Um, so then you say if I have two services, then I basically I don't know what mesh means. If you have two applications, what is the mesh in two application means? Um, that uh, well, uh, I'm not sure how much time you, you spent. Uh, Hope it, you know, steer me as I go to answer your question. Just, you know, uh, various folks have spent different amounts of times around um, service missions than others, but um, and, and the different styles of deployment. But um, more or less, if you consider that you have a workload today, that you, you've got an application that you're running, um, and if it has a you know um, an HTTP endpoint or multiple endpoints that people interface with, whether that's you know REST API or a web-based interface that um, in the land of microservices, um, you, you know, ideally, you, know, you need a bit more um, new tooling and control around um, the way in which uh, traffic flows through them. Mm -hmm. Maybe you, mm -hmm. you know, enforce circuit breaking or you want to um, get some, some visibility out of like, kind of just like top level um, service metrics or, uh, maybe the maybe the, the key point is that mesh is just a buzzword. It, it, sorry, it's Brian butting in here. Uh, so you know, if you can't quite see why the word mesh is appropriate, that's that's fine. It's just a word that the people doing this stuff have picked to describe what they're doing. And uh, so Istio does service mesh. Service mesh is what Istio does. Well, I mean, is it a load balancing? Is it a resource allocation? Yes. What is the mesh? No. I mean. It, it routes uh, calls to endpoints, to implementations of the service, and it can do that under a sophisticated set of rules uh, for reasons like load balancing or canary deployment, mm -hmm. or uh, you want your calls to go to the same data center for preference, or a hundred other, yeah, it's, it's all about uh, callers finding mm -hmm. callees but then it means really controlling the application. At least you have from, I don't know if it's the right point, from one, uh, from, uh, you have a control of the applications from one place. And yeah. uh, I you, guess you can no, the, the allocate mesh, the mesh thing, so Is that what it means? Yeah. The mesh, these things like Istio intercept the calls and redirect them that transparently to the application. And that is why you would want to measure the overhead. So intercepts and then this is the resources. This is a very good diagram, by the way. Yeah, uh, no, you, 
I'll put a link to this deck because I think Mehmet, you've got some fantastic questions, and uh, it does. I will do that. Sorry for uh, very basic questions, but <laughs> appreciate for the link. No, no. absolutely. If I could figure out how to get out of this, uh, very good. So anyway, um, with that, just it's uh, let let's jump into a demo. I think that that'll. Um, clarify a few things. So um, uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Garish so you can kind of show you how to you know, spin up the, the tool, take it for a whirl. Hey guys, uh, can you guys uh, hear me well? Yep. Okay, awesome. Yep. So um, to start with, like, you know, I know I'm, I'm starting off with a, with a blank terminal, but, uh, you know, uh, just uh, to get started with, like, you know, uh, with the tool, uh, we have the instructions posted on layer 5 io slash meshery. I'll be bringing up that site, like, you know, once I share the browser, but before I went to the browser, I just wanted to, you know, show you guys, like, you know, how to very quickly, like, you know, bring the services up. Um, so, so right now, like, you know, I, I am um, in, I am in a folder where I have actually cloned the meshery repo. Now in this repo, um, I do actually have um, a Docker Compose file. So um, now uh, obviously with Docker Compose, like, you know, so the simplest thing to do is, uh, you know, you just have to actually uh, do a Docker Compose um, up. Uh, if you want to run it in the background, you can actually add a hyphen D switch, but I'm just going to let it run in the foreground. Uh, now, uh, based on, uh, you know, uh, or based on uh, Lee's demo where he actually showed the architecture. Uh, so right now the meshery itself, like, you know, uh, on the local will actually consist of three components, uh, three services. Um, so when I actually do a Docker compose up, you'll actually see all the three components come up. Um, so the first one there is actually the Ford IO container. That's, uh, which is our load generator. The next one is the uh, Istio adapter for meshery, which was created by us. Um, of course, like, you know, so there will be more in future, like uh, what Lee mentioned, like, you know, uh, we are working with all the other uh, vendors. Um, and uh, the la last but not the least is actually the meshery service itself. Uh, so you can actually see all the three running and like, you know, waiting. So now I'm just going to switch over to uh, my browser. Um, I'm, I hope you guys can actually see my browser now. Can you guys see my browser? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So. So this is actually the page I was referring to. Uh, I think Lee also has shared the link to this page. Um, so uh, there is a section like, you know, which talks about running meshery. So essentially you just have to clone the repo and then do a Docker compose up uh, like what I've mentioned. Uh, once you do that, like, you know, uh, the meshery itself runs on port 9081 on your local host. Um, so you can actually go to that. And uh, right when you go there, you'll be redirected to a login page. Um, you know, which is uh, based off of Twitter uh, and uh, and our GitHub. So you can actually choose any of your choice. Um, I've already signed into Twitter, so I'm just going to choose Twitter. Uh, you'll be asked to authorize the application. Garish, actually, we're not seeing. Uh, we're just seeing the the meshery page. We're not seeing. Oh, oh I'm sorry. No, you might. Can you guys see uh, see my screen now? Yeah, we can see that now. You might. Want okay, to awesome. That. Yeah, I got you. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I think when I close the tab or something like, you know, the, the thing automatically paused. Okay, cool. So, so here is a meshery page. Here is uh, the brief instructions on how to run meshery. You just CD into the directory after you get clone and then do a Docker compose up um, and uh, you'll see the services running. Um, and then now to access meshery, um, it right now will be running on port 9081 on your local host. So I'm just going to open that in a separate tab. I really hope that. Uh, you guys can continue seeing my screen. So when once you go to localhost 9081, you'll see that the page immediately redirect, re, uh, redirects you to a login page. Um, and uh, this is a very simple login page, like, you know, and we have uh, um, a single sign-on set up with Twitter and our GitHub. Uh, you can choose any. Um, so now since I'm logged in with Twitter already in this browser session, like, and I'm just going to continue signing in with Twitter. Um, now you'll be presented with a screen to authorize the application. Uh, you just need to authorize and like, you know, once you authorize, you'll be taken to the uh, meshery application. Now, uh, again, like, you know, the meshery application contains uh, several sections. Uh, now, just one second, like, and I'm just gonna have, uh, I'm just gonna follow the uh, same thing, like, you know, we have. So uh, right after you log in, uh, you will be presented with a performance page. Of course, you, you can actually start, uh, you know, hitting a URL, like, you know, and specify some parameters. 
uh, and uh, you know you can hit submit and see the results. Uh, but uh, before I go there, like and I thought, like and it'll be nice to actually take you through configuring uh, or connecting to Kubernetes uh, from uh, from the Meshery instance. Uh, so um, I'm going to actually give it a, a cube config file. Uh, this is a cube config file for a cluster which is running in one of our labs, um, and uh, now this is a this is an admin config file, so I, there is no context. But uh, if you have multiple contexts in your config file, you can specify the context. And for the mesh adapter location, um, since uh, all the components are running as part of the Docker Compose, I'm just going to give the service name, which is meshery STO, and the port, which is uh, 10,000. Uh, so meshery and uh, the adapters are are communicating over gRPC. So we just need the you know the service name and the port. And once you hit submit, um, it will. Uh, so Meshery will talk to Meshery Istio, try to establish a connection with the Kubernetes cluster. If it succeeds, you'll be taken to this page where it'll say that Meshery is configured. Um, the other thing before I actually go on to the next thing is actually uh, we, have, we are facilitating connection with Grafana so that other than seeing the client-side metrics, you can also you know, uh, pull in pre-configured panels from Grafana into the Meshery UI and see all the results side by side. Um, so I have a... I have a Grafana instance again, like you know, running on my uh, on my cluster. Um, I'm just going to give the URL, and of course, like you know, if you have a API key configured, like you can actually give give that. Uh, but mine is an unsecured instance, so I'm just going to give the uh, base URL, and you just have to hit submit, um, and you'll see the uh, you know the, the connection to Grafana was successful. And uh, once it's successful, it'll actually pull in some information, like the the boards available, the panels available, like and all the metadata from Grafana. So uh, what this is for is that you can actually pick a, a, pick a board um, and uh, if the board has any template variables, you can actually pick any from there. Um, and uh, now by default, we have all the panels selected, but you can actually uh, deselect any of the panels. Uh, like for example, I can deselect that. Um, and then once you hit add, um, the page will actually present the, the, uh, the board and the panels from that board that were selected. And right beneath, like, you know, um, you will be able to see the, uh, uh, the panels uh, right away. Uh, the same way you're not restricted to one board, you can actually add more. For the sake of simplicity, I'll choose another small one. So right now you can see I have two boards, um, and again, like you know, so they are actually presented in a um, in a in a in an expansion panel. So um, you know, as you scroll, like you know, the data is loaded, and again, like you know, I have the time filters. Uh, pretty much, we try to keep the Grafana experience here. Um, and you can actually filter based on like you know what you need. So I'll just leave it at uh, last five minutes. Now that uh, we have configured Kubernetes, configured Grafana, um, I'll take you guys back to the play page where now that like, you know, we are connected to Kubernetes, um, uh, this tool actually lets you run commands on Kubernetes cluster directly from the UI. The other thing we have done for Istio again, um, uh, all, and uh, on this page, all the operations that are listed are actually specific to a mesh. Uh, they are served by the uh, adapters. So uh, one of the interesting operations is actually running Istio wet, uh, which is actually a tool for validating the configuration on the cluster. So uh, we have that enabled. So you know, um, I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually select that operation and hit submit. Now this will actually um, run uh, Istio wet command uh, connected to the cluster and uh, get, the, uh, get the data from uh, the cluster and populate the notifications on the right top. So, uh, you can see the operation succeeded and you can see the count for the uh, operations like an increment. Just give me one second. Yep, so, and then like, you know, when you click on it, like, you know, you'll actually see all the operations, like in you know, all the response from the HTO command coming up here. Uh, you can see all the vetters successfully ran and there was one error. So if you click on any, like, you know, you'll actually be taken to the details um, and uh, it'll actually show what the error was or what the details were. Um, and uh, you can either close them or you can actually dismiss them from here. Um, which will actually remove it from the list. Um, also, you can actually remove it from here, so just uh, ease of operation. So the same way you can actually um, run some other uh, commands, uh, which, uh, I mean, the mesh adapters like, you know, will actually facilitate. Now, apart from that, uh, we also provide a capability to actually run custom YAMLs against your cluster. So uh, for the sake of this demo, like, you know, I have a very simple YAML. Um, um, and uh, this is actually a uh, Istio command. But again, like, you know, uh, the, uh, the Istio adapter is kind of very general. Like, you know, it actually uses a dynamic, uh, uh, dynamic client. So you can actually use any Kubernetes construct, like, you know, which is valid on your cluster, um, like including CRDs or anything. So, um, so here is like, you know, one example. 
Uh, now I'm going to choose this and I'm going to hit submit and uh, you know this will be instantaneously applied on the cluster. Uh, if I reapply this, it'll update it, which is a, which is a nice thing. Um, if I want to delete it, I just flip the flag and then like you know, hit submit. Um, and uh, so so this way you can actually configure um, the mesh as well as the Kubernetes cluster from the UI. Uh, now once you're once you're configured and have the uh, mesh configured like you know to uh, the way you want it to be configured, you can actually come back to the performance page where uh, you can actually uh, you know, conduct the performance test. Now that Grafana is configured, uh, all the charts like, you know, which were configured in the previous screen uh, will actually be presented here. Um, now, uh, for running the performance test, I actually have a, a canonical book info app that's running on my cluster um, uh, here. So it's a, it's a canonical product page app for Istio. So I'm just going to use the same URL here um, and uh, I'm not going to change the defaults. I'm going to leave it as it is, and I'm going to hit submit. Um, so right now, since it's running for a duration of one minute, like you know, so I have this countdown time, uh, countdown timer show up for a minute. Uh, once this is done, uh, the uh, results uh, from the 4IO run will actually be populated in the graph right beneath. Uh, and uh, while we are also observing the chart. Uh, uh, we can also observe the uh, metrics from the cluster uh, because we have the uh, Grafana configured, which is essentially what I'll be showing in the next 30 seconds. Sorry. Uh, but essentially, I mean, like, you know, we are trying to improve the user experience. Um, and to give some uh, background information, uh, the UI uh, is uh, built off of React, and we're using Next.js as a framework. And uh, like Lee mentioned, the backend code is, uh, backend servers are all uh, written in Go. Uh, both the uh, main meshery and the uh, Istio adapters are written in Go. Um, and um, like I said, like, you know, they are communicating over gRPC. Um, uh, the uh, the previous wet command, which I showed, is actually streaming data to the UI using gRPC streaming and uh, using a service sentiments. So so now that like you know we have the results uh, for the test, uh, you can actually scroll down and also see uh, the results like you know from the cluster side, like you know which is because this these results are actually from the client side, uh, but uh, the Grafana charts are actually uh, feeding off of Prometheus, which is uh, on the cluster. So you can actually uh, compare the results um, uh, of the client side versus the server side, like you know uh, right from here in the same user interface. So you can actually add uh, more and more Grafana charts, like you know in order to make your uh, uh, quest for searching for something like you know, much more meaningful. So uh, that's the overall um, user experience. Uh, now there's one other thing. Now, um, anytime a, res uh, a test is run, we are also uh, giving the capability to persist the results. Um, so right now they're actually persisted on AWS. Um, so um, now uh, all your previous tests are, are persisted. So, which means, like in my case, like I have I have um, used this tool five times uh, before, and uh, so these are the results from my previous test runs. So, uh, from this interface, uh, you can actually expand and see the charts for each of the individual runs. Uh, now, this is actually the this is the run like you know, which I ran like you know two minutes back. Um, this was the one like you know, I ran like you know, an hour back or so, um, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, you can actually leave, I'm sorry. You can you can expand and leave them um, and compare them this way. Like you know, by you know, if you have a bigger screen, like you know, you should be able to compare them well. Uh, if not, I also have another way to compare. Uh, so you can click on one and click the compare uh, selected uh, feature. Um, if you compare multiple, then the charts will update accordingly, uh, and you can clearly see the distinction. Um, for more than for three or more charts, uh, again, like you know, the experience will be slightly different. Um, so, so this is another way where uh, not just comparing uh, or viewing the results for the most uh, recent run, but also you can actually compare it against like in you know, previous runs uh, you have. Unfortunately, I only have five, but um, this feature also, I mean, like you know, we also implemented pagination and selection across pages. So if you have um, a selected like you know result one from the first page and result four from the second page, you still will be able to compare them. So. Uh, that's pretty much where Meshery is today. Um, and like I said, like, you know, we are still working on it. Uh, it's, uh, it's about like two months old uh, since we started. So uh, this is the current state of Meshery. So the, you know, the, the view that we're on right now is probably the one that um, we we're able to compare performance results. Um, uh, certainly excited the students at UT Austin um, in, in its ability to help facilitate their research. 
Um, and then I, we're hoping that it will also illuminate or just an, answer those questions for uh, for adopters, you know, for people looking to understand um, the overhead of the mesh. There, there needs to be a bit more, a couple of other things, I think, to help facilitate um, this understanding. Um, that is some uh, sort of more out of the box uh, the tests, some, uh, helping the, um, some that are out of the box that, that um, when multiple people run and those results are gathered that um, uh, an anonymous report can be shared back that would tell people, you know, he, he, you know basically like a speed test, like you might test your internet uh, connectivity. It would tell you, you've got a, a fast mesh or a slow mesh or relative to this. Well, I mean, there's a lot of variables in there, but hopefully it would be, begin to provide, the more people that use it, <clears throat> um, the more value it might provide. Part of our thinking there as UT Austin goes to do testing in their HPC environment, that um, the CNCF infrastructure labs are maybe, maybe underutilized, and so maybe we would go and uh, ideally in combination with the other mesh projects, the, the vendors and their projects, um, go, run, go run some tests inside the CNCF lab. Part of that, as you guys go to ask some questions here, I think that the last thing to tie off with was, um, and Garish, I'm gonna try, I'll try to grab the ball from you if you uh, stop sharing, is um, it's the facilitation of the, an apples to apples um, comparison to the extent that that's possible. And Brian and Mamet and Ken, you guys are familiar with, I mean, you know, there's, all of the variables that are here, it's what size, what type of VM are you running in your clusters? What size are they? How big are your clusters? Are there, is there other activity? Is it in a vacuum? How many requests per second are you sending it for? How long, you know, how many services are you getting? You know, all these, all these variables. To the extent that that, um, that can be documented in something of a vendor, vendor neutral um, benchmark spec, uh, there's the start of one um, that's just a simple document that describes, that captures the environment details, the environment in which you're going to perform the test, the configuration details of your mesh, because you know, some meshes come with lots of different ways to configure them and run them, which affects performance, right? I was calling out distributed tracing and the overhead of sampling 100% or 1% being dramatically different. So mesh configuration matters. Uh, and then a spec to also capture the type of test you're going to run. I just said, gave an example of like, you know, you know, sending 10,000 requests per second or sending one, you know, one or how many concurrently and all these, all these variables that we, you'd be able to describe it in the spec and, and that would be shared part and parcel to the results would also be the spec that describes the environment. Um, so, so we're, we've got our fingers crossed that that's helpful to people as well. Yeah. Oh, I think this is fascinating, really. Uh, this is really fascinating. I will look at this back a little bit more and see what's going on, but it looks really fascinating. Yeah, thanks for that, Mara. Yeah, um, yeah do, do your worst. I think, yeah, um, it'd be great to, um, yeah, it'd be great to have you poking around, asking questions, uh, make it, making a mess, it'd be great. Uh, my observation, uh, I, I, I'd like to see it compared against the baseline, like with no mesh. Yeah. Yeah, like, hey, here's your, um, uh, and the, the tool right now allows you to do that. Um, it doesn't necessarily highlight that or facilitate for it well. Um, yeah, but in, ter in terms of your demo, you, you brought up a screen which had five runs of Istio, which probably ought to have been about the same. Uh, I would expect if you compared it against the baseline, then you, you see some real difference in the latency. Yeah, great point, Brian. Yeah. Uh, to, to like have it both just in, in the demo itself as, as we're walking people through to help them understand. It's probably, it's probably one of the more prominent questions that people have. It's like, here's my app performance off the mesh, here, here it is on the mesh. 
And yes, there's a bunch of other ways to, you know, other variables, but just, you know, that, that you know, simplistically, that high level answer is very insightful. Yeah. Taking a note. Yeah, this is very interesting, and I'm, I'm excited about the work you're doing here. Yeah, yeah thanks, Tim. It's, um, uh, it's been good. It's been good feedback. Actually, this is the first time outside of the community calls that the project's being presented. So, um, but but there seems to be interest. So, um, try, we're trying to spend what cycles we can. Yeah, definitely interest for sure. Um, but thanks, thanks for um, for the time today, Lee and um, Trish. Thanks for presenting the demo, and um, I will um, be in touch with you guys shortly about what the SIG network SIG or traffic SIG I should look like what that looks like and what things we want to propose to it. Nice, yeah, very good. Yep. Brian, if you've got any other uh, critical feedback, the more critical, the better. But, yeah. uh, no, I, I mean, I, I think it's a good idea. I think um, uh, I think a lot of your advanced ideas sh should work, but I, I think right in the meantime, you know, start start with simple stuff. And um, uh, I mean, maybe maybe do a bunch of, of benchmarking of of some. Kind of traditional ben, uh, traditional demo app. None none come to mind, but you know, I'm sure you can. Uh, there's, a, there's a sock shop out there somewhere, Brian. I don't know. Yeah, that's that's true. That would be one potentially. <laughs> I mean, it's it's sort of intentionally built way too complicated. But yeah, uh, if you can make a uh, yeah. demo out of that, then. Um, that's great because <laughs> it's got everything. Yeah. Um, Thanks, everyone. Have yeah. a have a great um, rest of your days. Much appreciated. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys.